So I think I, I just want to, I think, start things off. And your last movie uh, was much smaller in budget. And typically, well, I guess the trend now in Hollywood or filmmaking is you make a very small budget movie and then Marvel or DC or somebody picks you up to be like revamp of a property or big budget. And yet you chose to make an arguably bigger movie than Blue Ruin, but still not like enormous budget. And can you talk about what drove that decision uh, to sort of, instead of like, you know, work oh, for sure. Fox I mean, or something? It's like, like most of my movies, it, it was panic. <laughs> it was, you know, I had opportunities. Um, there was expectations after Blue Ruin and I didn't quite find the material I was looking for. I mean, I, had, I would love to do big movies eventually. Sure. I love studio movies in the 1970s and 80s. <laughs> but um, I, I kind of panicked and was like, ah, I gotta write something because I'm at the tail end of the festival circuit for Blue Ruin. And um, what I did was just take an idea that had been bouncing around my head for over a decade. So this is kind of like an emotional regression from Blue Ruin. I, I loved what we did with Blue Ruin. I didn't want to replicate that. I didn't want to try and top it. I wanted to kind of do a, a sort of homage to the films that I loved growing up and embrace the fact that I'm going to make a badass exploitation movie and um, have some kind of archive of my, my, my brief foray into the world of punk and hardcore. Because if you look at me, you wouldn't guess. You know, but I was there in the 90s. Um, I have one witness, where's Eli? There you go, he was there with me. He could do, he was kind of gorilla, did lots of backflips. We were in the same shows in the 1990s and it was a huge part of my life and it was a way to really kind of have an outlet and expression that was artistic and physical and not be part of a sports team. Um, and I was a skate punk in the 80s and it's kind of this, I was that person but as I found myself living in Brooklyn with three beautiful daughters and going to get pastries at the cafe, I was like, shit, no one's ever gonna know. <laughs> so let me just archive what I know and then, you know, up it a bit. Uh, okay, so talking about upping it a bit, I guess. Uh, so I, in order to prep for this, I watched this the other night with my fiance and at the arm cutting sh scene, she was like, nope, I'm out, I'm done. That's good. Uh, I, uh, the but she'll watch the Hunger Games, right? Yes. Where she 24 will. kids yeah. get slaughtered well, for sport yeah. and no one gives a shit. Or Batman versus Superman, where Batman blows away people with machine guns. You know? There you like, go. Because who cares? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I think I, I do want to talk about, you know, there's the, this real, uh, like, the violence in this film is clearly harking back to exploitation films and sort of the structure is similar to something like you know, I don't know, Assault on Precinct 13 or something. But there's also this aspect of this humanization and like this, like, I, I don't know, like a movie like Compliance where there's like, there's this human aspect of like why people are making these decisions behind the violence and it's, it's much more brutal and I program scary movies here and watch slashers all day and don't have a problem but watching this movie I'm like, oh, oh. Yeah, uh, I make it hurt. Yeah, was that, was that a problem for you? Like, no, I, I mean, well, yes, I mean, I definitely knew this had to be my next film because I might not have a stomach for it in a few years as I grow softer and softer. <laughs> but, um, no, I, you know, and like maybe it's just me bullshitting myself, but I think it's more responsible. Right. When, when the audience is gut punched or just like brutalized by these acts of violence, you know, I think that's better than not giving a flying fuck and watching, again, whoever get killed. I was inspired by Austin Powers. There's a scene when the henchman gets killed and they cut away to the henchman's wife at home and she gets a phone call. And you're like, that's amazing. Like no one ever <laughs> explores like that these people who die as extras in movies are real too. Right. And same with, you know, I mean Nazis are low hanging fruit for bad guys in movies. So the goal was to kind of humanize them. Right. And like not, it doesn't feel quite right except for maybe two scenes. But I think, I die. mean, I think even when you're killing the Nazis in this, it's not like, you know, the, I think any cheering or whatever on the audience part is almost like this catharsis that they experience because it's over rather than like, oh yeah, like, you know, a gory shot from a film, you know, except for maybe like the one-liner of like, oh, you really fl flabbergasted him or something maybe. Yeah. I don't know. 
That was the one scene. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was, it's telling a story. It's, it's, it's really designed to be narratively satisfying. And so it, it's fun to kind of break rules and be artsy and, and be natural. And also, I, I find I gravitate towards just films that I want to watch. And so there has to be some sort of narrative satisfaction to it. And that was the one time in the movie where there's a little bit of a, an actual climax with a high five moment. Right. Because I think we need that sometimes. I also appreciated that a lot of it was practical. Uh, Joe uh, Badiali, Badiali, how do you pronounce Did all the makeup effects? Uh, yeah, well, that's Mike Marino. Oh, okay. And his shop at, at a Jersey. They did an amazing job. My bad. Uh, well, because special effects and special effects makeup are very confusing oh, in yes. the credits. Yeah. Um, but they're different departments. One blows shit up <laughs> and breaks stuff. And one does all the makeup. Ah, okay. But no, it was it was like a great, you know, one of the best makeup artists on the East Coast, and uh, it was certainly a makeup show. But there's a lot of also CG compositing there. Like Chris Connolly, my buddy from NYU, does a lot of cleanup and stitching together shots. So there's about 70 visual effect shots in that movie. But the key is that you just don't feel that. Um, it's very important to me. Analog style. Right, <laughs> as it says in the beginning. Also, I wanted to talk, talk about, this is a movie, uh, Blue Ruin, you shot yourself. And then this movie, you worked with a DP, Sean Porter, who's mm -hmm. shot a lot of films. Uh, what was that transition like for you? Was it hard to give up control over the visual aspect of the film? or Not on this one. It was, it was a beast, you know? It was like the hardest part, because Blue Ruin was very much designed to be purely visual, so me looking through the eyepiece and experiencing what's happening through the lens and nudging the camera intuitively. Just, that's how we told that story. Um, with Green Room, it was insane ensemble coverage and sort of high impact action scenes and pit bulls and things that I needed to really keep watch over that I, I couldn't do kind of having my tunnel vision when I'm obsessed with the camera and the lens. And so I think I picked Sean Porter because he was so versatile. And he didn't always put his stamp on a movie. He really was able to acclimate and um, do films like Kimiko the Treasure Hunter, a very formal movie with classic composition and static frames. And it felt like love. It was a very intimate, handheld uh, film. And so I, I figured, with very naturalistic lighting, and I figured he could just sort of um, translate whatever I needed on the screen because he is a chameleon. And um, are we getting signals? I'm getting a signal. <laughs> uh, so I think we can do one audience question. So one? It better be good. It's like a, a speed round. All right. Right there. Thank you. The question was about uh, balancing the genre aspects uh, in the film. Yeah, no, I, I certainly, I like films that ride the line. And I, I never try to be funny. I just kind of let it happen. When I find situations that are absurd or, or tragically human, you know, it's like I can, I can find light there and it just kind of pops up. But yeah, it's, 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 a, it's definitely a balancing act and it's, it's what I love. I like, and I said this before, but my favorite comedies are Zodiac, and uh, Boogie Nights, because they're so human and they're so perfect, and I laugh out loud. And um, I like a good comedy too, but it's not hitting that sort of cinematic part of my brain. Um, but I just try to make it human and, and grounded and something that I want to see that I think might fill a void for audiences. All right, quick, quick question, second question. There in the middle with the hat, yes. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of research. Um, but, you know, in the 90s, the Nazi punks were at every show we would go to in Washington, D.C. There was a much more, I guess, visible presence. I mean, even when I wrote this movie, it was uh, a throwback to the 90s. And unfortunately, it's become far too relevant in the last two years. Um, 
because of this sort of big uptick. But no, it's, I mean, I, I used to watch documentaries on it, um, for various sort of white power gangs, because they used punk rock as a recruitment tool. And it, it was part of the scene, yet very separate. They didn't share the ideology, and they attracted violence. They, you know, it, they were never the majority in Washington, D.C. But when they were there, uh, they'd cause trouble sometimes, but more often than not, they would get beat up. They weren't welcome, but they attracted violence. And I think one time there was a stabbing outside a club, and just stuck with me and because they are they are militarized. They are in uniform. They have a different structure than vegans who go like somewhere after the show and talk about stuff, <laughs> you know. And they're scary. Like, and there's there's, a, there's bands I was referring to directly. They are that leaned Nazi that would go to shows. People liked their music, didn't quite hear the lyrics, and they would beat the fuck out of people in the pit, you know. Um, I was never part of, I was never hard, you know, I was, I was in pretty good shape back then, but, uh, <laughs> you know, once, you know, I got, I got beat up, I was in a hardcore band, you know, and just kind of played a couple of shows, it was more of a wallflower, but this guy, Larry, he's big in the DC scene, he beat the shit out of me, <laughs> for no reason, didn't know, know who I was, and it was just part of this, the violence, you know, it was real, and then, I went back, I was like, whoa, I got my ass kicked. And that, why did Larry do that? And he's like, oh, he probably didn't know it was you, man. He's a big fan of your band. <laughs> I was like, shit. That's how it was. It was a crazy people, like, just having, but it, the energy was real. And that's what I hoped, I, I wanted to capture in that one scene where there's, like, Nazi punks and this sort of out-of-town band. And there's, there's real tension, but they, through the music, it's, the, the energy is real. And, and there's a lot of support. I didn't, I didn't couldn't, like, focus on different parts of the scene. I had to stick to the Nazis here, because this, this is a movie. But yeah, it was like, it's important to capture like why they're there, and it, there's a theme in the film about you gotta be there. You can't go SoundCloud this shit. You have to show up. And you know, so that, that's my takeaway. It's just like, um, but the research was brutal and disturbing. And it, again, it was uh, kind of thrown away. There's no like, there's not a ton of speeches. The only speech you get out of Darcy is, come next Wednesday for the racial advocacy workshop. You know, that's some bullshit. Anyways. All right, I'm getting the, the, the cutoff signal. Thank you so. very much for showing up. I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you, guys. It. Thank, Thank you, Jeremy. Me.